Chapter 15, Go On or Die Harriet had found it hard to leave the warmth and friendliness, too, but she urged them on. For a while as they walked, they seemed to carry in them a measure of contentment. Some of the serenity and the cleanliness of that big warm kitchen lingered on inside them. But as they walked farther and farther away from the warmth and the light, the cold and the darkness entered into them. They fell silent, sullen, suspicious. She waited for the moment when some of them would turn mutinous. It did not happen that night. Two nights later, she was aware that the feet behind her were moving slower and slower. She heard the irritability in their voices, knew that soon someone would refuse to go on. She started talking about William Still and the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee. No one commented. No one asked any questions. She told them the story of William and Ellen Craft and how they escaped from Georgia. Ellen was so fair that she looked as though she were white, and so she dressed up in a man's clothing and she looked like a wealthy young planter. Her husband, William, who was dark, played the role of her slave. Thus they traveled from Macon, Georgia, to Philadelphia, riding on the trains, staying in the finest hotels. Ellen pretended to be very ill. Her right arm was in a sling, and her right hand was bandaged, because she was supposed to have rheumatism. Thus she avoided having to sign the register at the hotels, for she could not read or write. They finally arrived safely in Philadelphia, and then went on to Boston. No one said anything. Not one of them seemed to have heard her. She told them about Frederick Douglass, the most famous of the escaped slaves, of his eloquence, of his magnificent appearance. Then she told them of her own first vain effort at running away, evoking the memory of that miserable life she had led as a child, reliving it for a moment in the telling. But they had been tired too long, hungry too long, afraid too long, footsore too long. One of them suddenly cried out in despair, let me go back. It is better to be a slave than to suffer like this in order to be free. She carried a gun with her on these trips. She had never used it except as a threat. Now as she aimed it, she experienced a feeling of guilt, remembering that time years ago when she had prayed for the death of Edward Brodus, the master, and then not too long afterward had heard the great wailing cry that came from the throats of the field hands and knew from the sound that the master was dead. One of the runaways said again, Let me go back, let me go back, and stood still and then turned around and said over his shoulder, I am going back. She lifted the gun, aimed it at the despairing slave, and she said, Go on with us or die. The husky, low-pitched voice was grim. She hesitated for a moment, and then he joined the others. They started walking again. She tried to explain to them why none of them could go back to the plantation. If a runaway returned, he would turn traitor. The master and the overseer would force him to turn traitor. The returned slave would disclose the stopping places, the hiding places, the corn stacks they had used with the full knowledge of the owner of the farm, the name of the German farmer who had fed them and sheltered them. These people who had risked their own security to help runaways would be ruined, fined, imprisoned. She said, we got to go free or die, and freedom's not bought with dust. This time, she told them about the long agony of the Middle Passage on the slave ships, about the black horror of the holds, about the chains and the whips. They, too, knew these stories, but she wanted to remind them of the long, hard way they had come, about the long, hard way they had yet to go. She told them about Thomas Sims, the boy picked up on the streets of Boston and sent back to Georgia. She said when they got him back to Savannah, got him in prison there, they whipped him until a doctor who was standing by watching said, you will kill him if you strike him again. His master said, let him die. Thus she forced them to go on. Sometimes she thought she had become nothing but a voice speaking in the darkness, cajoling, urging, threatening. Sometimes she told them things to make them laugh. Sometimes she sang to them, and heard the eleven voices behind her blending softly with hers, and then she knew that for the moment all was well with them. She gave the impression of being a short, muscular, indomitable woman who could never be defeated, yet at any moment she was liable to be seized by one of these curious fits of sleep which might last for a few minutes or for hours. Even on this trip she suddenly fell asleep in the woods, the runaways, ragged, dirty, hungry, cold, did not steal the gun as they might have and set off by themselves or turn back. They sat on the ground near her and waited patiently until she awakened. They had come to trust her implicitly, totally.
They, too, had come to believe her repeated statement. We got to go free or die. She was leading them into freedom, and so they waited until she was ready to go on. Finally, they reached Thomas Garrett's house in Wilmington, Delaware. Just as Harriet had promised, Garrett gave them all new shoes and provided carriages to take them on to the next stop. By slow stages, they reached Philadelphia, where William Still has hastily recorded their names and the plantations whence they had come, and something of the life they had led in slavery. Then he carefully hid what he had written, for fear it might be discovered. In 1872, he published this record book in form and called it The Underground Railroad. In the foreword to his book, he said, While I knew the danger of keeping strict records, and while I did not then dream that in my day slavery would be blotted out, or that the time would come when I would publish these records, it used to afford me great satisfaction to take them down, fresh from the lips of fugitives, on the way to freedom, and to preserve them as they had given them. William Still, who was familiar with all the station stops on the Underground Railroad, supplied Harriet with money and sent her and her 11 fugitives on to Burlington, New Jersey. Harriet felt safer now, though there were danger spots ahead, but the biggest part of her job was over. As they went farther and farther north, it grew colder, and she was aware of the wind on the Jersey Ferry and aware of the cold damp in New York. From New York, they went on to Syracuse, where the temperature was even lower. In Syracuse, she met the Reverend J.W. Logan, known as Jarm Logan. This was the beginning of a lifelong friendship. Both Harriet and Jarm Logan were to become friends and supporters of old John Brown. From Syracuse, they went north again into a colder, snowier city, Rochester. Here they almost certainly stayed with Frederick Douglass, for he wrote in his autobiography. On one occasion, I had 11 fugitives at the same time under my roof, and it was necessary for them to remain with me until I could collect sufficient money to get them to Canada. It was the largest number I ever had at one time, and I had some difficulty in providing so many with food and shelter. But, as may well be imagined, they were not very fastidious in either direction and were well content with very plain food and a strip of carpet on the floor for a bed or a place on the straw in the barn loft. Late in December 1851, Harriet arrived in St. Catharines, Canada West, now Ontario, with the 11 fugitives. It had taken almost a month to complete this journey. Most of the time had been spent getting out of Maryland. That first winter in St. Catharines was a terrible one. Canada was a strange, frozen land, snow everywhere, ice everywhere, and a bone-biting cold like that of which none of them had ever experienced before. Harriet rented a small frame house in the town and set to work to make a home. The fugitives boarded with her. They worked in the forest, felling trees, and so did she. Sometimes she took other jobs, cooking or cleaning house for people in the town. She cheered on these newly arrived fugitives, working herself, finding work for them, finding food for them, praying for them, sometimes begging for them. Often she found herself thinking of the beauty of Maryland, the mellowness of the soil, the richness of the plant life there. The climate itself made for an ease of living that could never be duplicated in this bleak, barren countryside. In spite of the severe cold, the hard work, she came to love St. Catharines and the other towns and cities in Canada where black men lived. She discovered that freedom meant more than the right to change jobs at will, more than the right to keep the money that one earned. It was the right to vote and to sit on juries. It was the right to be elected to office. In Canada, there were black men who were county officials and members of school boards. St. Catharines had a large colony of ex-slaves, and they owned their own homes, kept them neat and clean and in good repair. They lived in whatever part of town they chose and sent their children to the schools. When spring came, she decided that she would make this small Canadian city her home, as much as any place could be said to be home to a woman who traveled from Canada to the eastern shore of Maryland as often as she did. In the spring of 1852, she went back to Cape May, New Jersey. She spent the summer there cooking in a hotel. That fall, she returned, as usual, to Dorchester County and brought out nine more slaves, conducting them all the way to St. Catharines in Canada West, to the bone-biting cold, the snow-covered forests, and freedom. She continued to live in this fashion, spending the winter in Canada and the spring and summer working in Cape May, New Jersey, or in Philadelphia. She made two trips a year into slave territory, one in the fall and another in the spring. 
She now had a definite crystallized purpose, and in carrying it out, her life fell into a pattern which remained unchanged for the next six years. In April 1851, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who once described herself in a letter as a little bit of a woman, somewhat more than 40, about as thin and dry as a pinch of snuff, never very much to look at in my best days, and looking like a used-up article now, sent the first chapter of what she thought would be a short novel to the National Era, an anti-slavery weekly published in Washington, D.C. It turned out to be a very long book, 11 months elapsed before she finished it. The book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, or Life Among the Lowly, was published in two volumes in March 1852. It was an instantaneous success. 300,000 copies were sold in the first year after its publication. Men and women read it, talked about it, cried over the death of little Eva and of Uncle Tom, shuddered at the cruelty of Simon Legree. Its influence was incalculable. Many of its readers became foes of the whole system of slavery. Before the Civil War, eight different plays based on the life of Uncle Tom had been written and produced, without Mrs. Stowe's consent. During the summer of 1853, Professor Calvin Stowe, Mrs. Stowe's husband, wrote, The drama of Uncle Tom has been going on in the National Theater of New York all summer with most unparalleled success. Everybody goes night after night, and nothing can stop it.